Bifocal, Chapter 22, J. I took the bottle and brought it up to my lips. I tipped it back, but pushed my tongue forward to stop any of the whiskey from actually entering my mouth. The little bit that leaked through tasted like iodine and burned my mouth. I wanted to spit it out or rinse my mouth, but I couldn't. I couldn't do that for the same reason. I couldn't say no thank you when it was past my way. This was easier. Nobody would notice I wasn't drinking. To everybody else, it just looked like I was being one of the guys. I was one of the guys. It was a big circle of guys. There were 11 of us now, all members of the football team. These guys were my friends, the people I knew best and trusted the most. We'd gone to war together. They were like my family. No, that wasn't right. Not a family. A tribe. Strange, I should have felt comfortable being here, but I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. We were hidden away in the corner of the parking lot at the back of the school, a little nook behind the auto shop. Kevin had assured us there wasn't even a camera aimed at this section. Nobody could see us from the street. Not us or the three cars. It was almost completely dark, and we were safely enveloped by the shadow of the school. It didn't hurt that it was late, almost ten o'clock, late enough that all the little kids were finished trick-or-treating and were off the streets. The bottle came around again. I looked at the label. Scotch whiskey. Age seven years. I guess it would take that long to make something taste that bad. You planning on reading or drinking, one of the guys said. Drinking. I put it up to my lips again and faked taking a snort. I passed the bottle. James passed it to the next guy without taking a drink. James, along with Kevin and Paul, were driving, and none of the drivers was drinking. I like that. We were socially responsible before going out to cause havoc. Everybody had a mask perched atop of their head. The mask probably said something about the person who was going to be wearing it. Steve had a clown mask. Kevin was a vampire. I was wearing my favorite cartoon character, an all-round amphibian superhero, Leonardo, leader of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hero in a half shell. Turtle power. I had the mask since I was a kid, and I dug it out of my old toy box. The other masks included Freddy Krueger, a zombie, a skeleton, a mummy, a gorilla, a dog with a very happy expression, and two guys wearing the scream getup. It was bizarre watching the bottle get passed from person to person, the mask looking down from the top of everybody's head. Now, if everybody has had enough liquid courage, we can begin, Kevin started. Where are we going? One of the guys asked. If I told you, it wouldn't be a surprise. Just follow me. Can't we have a clue, James asked. Kevin smiled. I'll only tell you that our first stop has a connection to one of the schools we simply love to play. Let's saddle up. There was a lot of hoots and hollers as we climbed into the cars. I jumped into the back seat of Kevin's car, Steve up front. One of our linemen, Junior, climbed in beside me. Of course, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was pretty happy to be part of it. Kevin squealed out of the parking lot, laying rubber. I looked behind us as James' car and a van followed behind him. Kevin pushed in a CD and ACDC came to life. What could be better Halloween music than Highway to Hell? Steve reached over and turned the music up full blast so the speakers behind my head felt like they were in my head. My friends are going to be there too. I'm on a highway to hell, on a highway to hell, highway to hell. I'm on the highway to hell. Steve started singing along, and then the rest of us joined in. We got louder and louder, singing along, out of key but safely concealed by the music and the mass. No stop sign, speed limits, nobody's going to slow me down. Kevin flicked off the lights, turned off the music, and slowed down the car. I didn't even want to breathe. He pulled the car over to the side of the road, and the other two vehicles pulled in behind us. It was a quiet residential street with trees so big and full that the streetlights were lost amongst the branches and the street was dark. There were houses on one side of the street, nice big houses set back from the street, protected by long driveways, lawns, and flowers. On the other side were trees, a park, a small forest in the middle of the subdivision. We climbed out of the vehicles. Everybody instinctively knew to be quiet, even trying to close the doors without making too much noise. Kevin went to the back of his car and opened the trunk. The interior light in the trunk shone brightly so we could see the contents. I couldn't believe my eyes. Inside were the heads of lettuce and tomatoes and dozens of rolls of toilet paper and flats of eggs. There was a collective gasp. People were amazed and impressed by the supplies, by the ammunition. Help yourselves, but remember, this is just one stop of many. How many, somebody asked. I'm thinking four, but you never know. Greedily, people reached in and grabbed, filling their pockets and hands. 
I didn't want any eggs in my pockets, but I grabbed a couple of tomatoes, three eggs, and a roll of toilet paper. I looked across the street at the house. One of them had a few lights on, a second was pitch black, and a third had every light in the whole house blazing. I was hoping for the one in the middle. Maybe nobody was home, or if they were, they were all asleep. The street itself was quiet and deserted. Follow me, Kevin said. To my surprise, he didn't head across the street, but into the forest. We all followed behind. It was instantly darker than on the street. We stepped into the shadows and basically vanished. We headed along a long, dark, narrow trail, a bumpy dirt path that weaved between the trees and the bushes. The guy in front of me stumbled over a root and cursed loudly. He was instantly shushed into silence. The trees gave way to the grass. We crossed through the outfield of a deserted baseball diamond. We slipped out the other side of the field and then came to stop behind some bushes edging another street. There was a lot of huffing and puffing, mainly from the linemen. You would have figured by now they'd be in better shape. We're here, Kevin said, as the last of the stragglers joined us. Yeah, one of them puffed. But why didn't we just drive here? We got cars. Cars have license plates. Cars can be traced. By putting the cars on the other side of the park, we can't be connected to anything that is going to happen. That was smart. That was Kevin. It was like he was calling a play in the huddle. So what are we going to do? Steve asked. Or, I guess, to whom are we going to do it? See that house right there? Kevin said. The one with the really nice flowers and that clean white Mustang in the driveway? I know that car, somebody said. Maybe you do. It belongs to the coach of the Streetsville Stingers football team. Which one? Which coach? The big one. The head jerk. The head coach. The one who called us bad sports. How do you know that he lives here? James asked. Easy. I followed him home from his school last week. You did what? I followed him. A little planning for tonight. I was sort of the advanced scout. I looked past the car to the house. There was a light on the porch and a light in an upstairs window, but the rest of the house was dark. He was probably upstairs in his bedroom, but not asleep yet. Everybody put their hands in, Steve said. Remember, we're all in this together. If anybody gets caught, you take the fall, but you don't rat out anybody else. Agreed? Everybody agreed. A couple of the guys were too loud, and they were quieted down. We go in fast, we get out fast. We get to the cars, and we get out of here. Everybody put on your masks. We all pulled them on. We were one freaky-looking group. Okay, break. This was all so familiar and safe and foolproof, just like football. Kevin calling the play and us following through. He told us what to do, and we did it. We all fanned out, trying to move silently as we crossed the street and moved towards the house. Get the tires first, Kevin hissed. Flatten the tires. Four people, one on each wheel, bent down. In the silence, I could hear air escaping as they pressed down on the valves. The tires flattened and the car lowered. Now, Kevin yelled. A hailstorm of eggs, tomatoes, and toilet paper were thrown at the house, car, and bushes, smashing, crashing, thumping, and thudding as they hit their marks. I threw a second egg, then a tomato, then a third egg. Suddenly, another light came on downstairs, and the front door flung open. It was the Streetsville coach. He was in his boxers, with a bare chest and feet, screaming. An egg smashed into his face. He stumbled backwards with the impact and then roared with anger. He was like some large, wounded water buffalo. He was close enough that I could see the expression on his face glaring through the egg. I felt the rush of fear and adrenaline surge through my body. We started running, sprinting across the grass. Only Steve was in front of me. I stole a glance backward, looking through the edges of the mass eye holes. Everybody else was coming, the big linemen making better time than they ever did in the wind sprints at practice. Way behind them, I saw the Streetsville coach. He was screaming and yelling and chasing, but he was old and slow and fat, and he was falling further behind as we ran. There was no way he could catch us. He was mad, but his anger only gave us all more fear, and that produced more feed. We hit the outskirts of the trees, and Steve ripped off his mask. I did the same. Hidden in the shadows, we stopped and looked back. Scattered across the outfield, their arms and legs pumping as hard as each of them could, was an assortment of masked characters. Way back, still out on the street, the Streetsville coach stood yelling, screaming, swearing, so angry and so loud that it felt like he was a lot closer than he was. The next two in line caught up with us and skidded to a stop. The others were closing in. Only two of the big linemen were still in the distance. 
Suddenly, the coach spun around and started running back towards his house, then jumped into his car. He must have figured we were cutting through the park to our vehicles on the other side. He squealed backwards and started to drive before coming to an abrupt halt on his four flat tires. I'd forgotten about that. The last of the linemen came chugging up, almost collapsing into the bushes, huffing and puffing. I knew letting the air out of those tires would come in handy, Kevin said, but let's hustle anyways before he gets the cops here. Come on, let's go. There was a certain high involved with the whole thing, driving in the car with the music pounding and the guys yelling, sneaking up on the houses silently, barraging them with eggs and vegetables and toilet paper. There was a danger and, of course, the fear of getting caught. It was like being in a football game, except losing this one might involve getting caught and thrown in jail. Definitely a different penalty than ten yards for holding. We'd been to two more places. The first of those had been dark and stayed dark. If anybody was home, they weren't even going to turn on the lights. I was told who lived there. It was Mr. Perkins. He taught business at our school. I'd never been in any of his classes, but I knew him to see him, and I'd heard that he was a pain in the butt and was always hassling people in the hall for no good reason. And he liked failing people. He almost caused a couple of the guys to become disqualified for football because he was such a hard marker. Other teachers gave football players a break, which was only fair because we were working so hard to represent the school. Not him. What a jerk. Despite it all, I couldn't help but think it, what it would have been like for him to be in the house when the bombardment started. He would have been pretty eerie to be sitting there in the dark while your house was assaulted. He wouldn't know who it was exactly, but he had to know it was students from his school. I wondered if his wife was with him, or if he had kids, or whatever. I didn't like him, but I could picture his face. I tried to block out that picture. I forced myself not to picture him, not to imagine his family. The last house had been dark, but when we got closer, a motion detector kicked in and lit up the whole front yard. We stood there, wearing our masks, arms back, eggs in hand, ready to throw. Everybody froze, exposed by the light. Then Kevin yelled and threw the first egg. We all snapped into action. It was even stranger watching the explosion of the eggs, the flight of the tomatoes, the way the light reflected off the brilliant white rolls of toilet paper as they hit the trees, house, and hydro wires. In spite of the light, maybe because of the light, the people inside didn't even poke their heads out. They could see how many of us there were. The Streetsville coach had been brave, or stupid, or just so angry that he didn't think that when he ran out after us. I wondered what I would have done if it was my house. At least I'd never have to picture the people inside the last house. It was a former principal of school, gone before I even got there. The car slowed down, and we turned into the parking lot of a small park. There was a darkened tennis court on one side, a deserted playground on the other, and a large stretch of grass reached out into the distance. This looked familiar. With all the driving in the dark, blurred by the music and excitement, I'd lost any sense of where we were. But we were back in our general area. At least, I thought we were. We got out of the vehicles and gathered around the jungle gym. Nobody was even trying to be quiet anymore. Somebody pulled out a bottle and passed it around. This time, I took a bigger sip. It still tasted like poison, but it was part of the experience. It burned a track down my throat and into my stomach. People were joking, laughing, pushing. There was a real sense of excitement, of being part of something, just like a football game, and this was halftime. Replace the masks with helmets, the dark clothes with uniforms, and the smell of whiskey with sweat. I was feeling the high of the game. This is our last stop of the night, Kevin said. Come on, let's keep going, somebody yelled, and others called out in agreement. I was one of them. That surprised me. I'd been so reluctant to get started, so scared after that first house, and now I wanted things to keep going. There was a high to this. It made me feel like I was part of something. We were in this together. We're running out of ammunition, and it's getting late, Kevin said, and we do have practice tomorrow at 7.30. There was a collective groan. Practice? Football? How about if we don't do any wind sprints, because we did them tonight, James asked, and the groans were replaced by laughs. Sure, you explain why to Coach Pruitt, Kevin said. Let's just finish it up right. This is like the fourth quarter. No easing up. We hurried to the back of his car. I want it cleaned right out, Kevin said. 
People reached in, grabbing the last of the eggs, tomatoes, and toilet paper until there was nothing left. Kevin reached in, grabbed the empty egg flats, and threw them onto the ground. There, no evidence left in the car. He closed the trunk with a thud. We left the cars behind and started across the park. It was so dark that the few scattered streetlights couldn't penetrate into the park at all. We picked up speed as we traveled. The adrenaline was kicking in again. Just follow my lead, Kevin said. We came out of the park, and as one, we pulled down our mask. We ran down the street and cut on to the second, staying right in the middle of the street like we owned it. If a car was to come along, I don't know if we would have hidden or forced it to get out of our way. We had a sense of power, of purpose. The houses were all dark. It was almost midnight, and everybody was probably tucked in bed for the night. Here's the place, Kevin said. It looked identical to all the other houses on the street. A bungalow set back from the street, big long, flowers in front. If they had a car, it was in the garage. Everybody wait, Kevin said. We stopped, and Kevin crept up towards the house by himself. There was no motion detector's trigger, and the house remained dark. Kevin stopped by the garage. He pulled something out of his pocket, something metal. I could see the light reflect off of it. He held it up. And then I heard the hissing sound and instantly knew what he was doing. He was spray painting something on the side of the garage. I suddenly pictured Kevin spraying words on the side of the school and on the benches of Browntown. But of course, he couldn't have done that. He was with us at the football game. He finished and motioned for us to come forward. Slowly, we closed in on the house, fanning out across the whole front. Now, Kevin yelled as he threw the first egg. Instantly, every arm flung something at the house, and the throws were accompanied by yells and shrieks. Eggs, tomatoes, and toilet paper littered the house property. Within 30 seconds, everybody had tossed everything they had, but there was no response from the house. It remained dark. But instead of just running away, one of the guys ran up to the porch, grabbed a flower pot, and threw it against the house. It smashed against the wall into a million pieces. Other guys rushed forward, grabbed the rest of the pots out of the front, and threw them against the sidewalk and the porch and the house. Kevin grabbed a flower pot and lifted it over his head. He threw it, and there was a tremendous crash as it smashed through the front picture window. Everybody froze, shocked. Lights came on the neighboring houses, and then a second house, three doors down, lit up. All at once, we started running back down the street, heading for the park. I was well in front of the pack, and I looked back over my shoulder. The house was still dark. Maybe nobody had been home. Maybe they had been home and were huddled together, hiding, afraid. I just hoped nobody was standing at that window when it shattered. We ran across the park. That smash window had given everybody an extra jolt of energy. Quickly, we got into the cars and sped away, Kevin leading, the other two vehicles following. The only sound was the panting of our breath. Nobody was talking. I couldn't get out of my mind the picture of that pot smashing through the window. It was loud and spectacular and dangerous. The eggs and tomatoes were one thing, but we had crossed the line. If there had been another pot right there beside me, I might have thrown it too, and that scared me most of all. Safely, away from the area, Kevin slowed down and turned off the road and into the mall. It was late and the stores were closed, the lights off behind the big glass windows. He pulled around the side of the last door to the back. The two other cars followed. We were now shielded on one side by the stores and on the other three by a large cement barrier fence. He came to a stop and turned off the engine. As the other two cars stopped and turned off their lights, it became dark. We all climbed out and gathered around Kevin. Gentlemen, that concludes our night. Everybody, give me your mask. He held out a plastic grocery bag, and one by one, everybody dropped their mask into it. I followed along. The only evidence linking us to the events of tonight is now in this bag, he said. He tied the bag in a knot and then tossed it in the dumpster behind one of the stores. If anybody asks where you were or what you did tonight, what are you going to answer? James's place, watching a movie, somebody said. That's right, James said. We were all at my place. Lucky for us, my father is out of town on business, and my mother went with him. So we had the house to ourselves, right? Everybody laughed and agreed. What movie did we see? Kevin asked. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street, James said. I own the DVD. Everybody's seen it, right? Kevin asked, and we all nodded in agreement. Who wouldn't have seen that movie? So, what do we say if anybody asks us? Kevin continued. But who's going to ask us? I questioned. Parents, friends, whoever. It's late and a school night. I couldn't help but wonder about the whoever part. 
What happened tonight stays here, Kevin said. We tell nobody, no friends, no girlfriends, who could become ex-girlfriends and rat us out. Not even the members of the team. And we don't talk to each other about it for a few weeks. Agreed? Again, there was a course of agreement. I certainly wasn't going to tell anybody, that was for sure. Hands in, Kevin said. One by one, we placed our hands on top of each other until we formed one big pile. On three, one, two, three, break, we all yelled.